So please a warm welcome for Jonathan Franzen and Tom Barber. So welcome, it's great to see everybody here. Um, I thought we, uh, uh, Jonathan's agreed to read a, a short section of the book to start off with, so. I will read a short section, <laughs> <laughs> but we have much to fit in because Tom is going to converse with me and then, yes, right? Um, so really eat the mic, that, that's the situation. Can you still not hear back there? Can you hear back there? So we just raise our voices a little bit. Right, can be heard. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, and then and then I want to make sure there's time for audience Q and A too. Do I have to sit in this chair while I read? Yeah. I guess I'm, no, no. <laughs> Ask and shall receive. Yeah, but maybe I'll just stand up. And just stand up, Mike. Yeah, sure. Mike, stand. Sure, sure, sure yeah. Sure. Great. We need a way up because it's not picking up very well. Yeah, we'll turn it up. Okay, so well, hello. <laughs> um, there. It's nice to be here. September one. Um, so yeah, I, what do you do with, with a six-minute reading? So I'm just going to read something, and then we'll, that'll be over. <laughs> can, can you hear me in back? Yes, good. Um, apologies for the space. This is uh, the only section of the book that's in first person. My affair with Annabelle had begun as soon as our divorce decree came through. In exchange for stipulating that I'd abandoned her, abandonment being one of the few grounds for divorce that New York state law recognized, and the one that Annabelle felt best captured the wrong she'd suffered. <laughs> I'd been permitted to reclaim our valuable rent-controlled tenement in East Harlem while Annabelle went off to live by herself in the woods of New Jersey. Since there could be no talk of inflicting Manhattan on her, I had to take the bus across 125th and the subway up to 168th followed by a much longer and invariably nauseating bus ride over the Hudson and out through increasingly raw developments to the hills northwest of Netcong. I'd made this trip twice in February, twice in March, and once in April. On the last Saturday in May, my phone rang around 7 in the morning, not long after I'd gone to bed drunk. I answered it only to stop the ringing. <laughs> oh, Annabelle said. I thought I was going to get your machine. I'll hang up and you can leave a message, I said. No, this is only going to be 30 seconds. I swear I will not get drawn in again. Annabelle, I just want to say that I reject your version of us. I utterly reject it. That's my message. <laughs> Couldn't you have rejected my version by just never calling me again? <laughs> I'm not getting drawn in, she said, but I know the way you operate. You interpret silence as capitulation. You don't remember promising me, <clears throat> you don't remember me promising I'd never interpret your silence that way the very last time we spoke? I'm hanging up now, she said, but at least be honest, Tom, and admit that your promise was a low trick, a way of having the last word. I laid the phone on my mattress next to my ear and mouth. Are we at the point yet where I get blamed for this conversation lasting more than 30 seconds? Or do I still have that to look forward to? <laughs> no, I'm hanging up, she said. I wanted to say for the record that you're completely wrong about us, but that's all. So I'm going to hang up. Okay, then. Goodbye. But she could never hang up, and I could never bear to do it for her. I'm not blaming you, she said. You did consume my youth and then abandon me, but I know you're re not responsible for my happiness out here. Although, in fact, I'm having a good time and things are going pretty well, unbelievable as it may sound, to a person who considers me, quote, unequipped to deal with the, quote, real world. 
consumed my youth and then abandoned me, I quoted back, but this is not a provocation, you just wanted to leave a 30 second message. <laughs> Which I would have done, but you reacted, I reacted, Annabelle. Do I need to point this out? I reacted to your picking up a telephone and dialing my number. Right, I know, because I'm so needy, right? I'm so pathetically needy. I couldn't have named one instant of happiness or ease from our previous togetherness binge four weeks earlier. I emerged from these binges feeling bruised and harrowed with worrisome bomb craters in my memory, but also a vague, sick craving for a do-over. Look, I said, do you want me to get, do you want to get together? Do you want me to come out? Is that what you called? No, I do not want to get together. I want to hang up the phone if you would please just let me. <laughs> Usually in the past though, when you've called, I said, you've started out saying you didn't want to get together. And then after a couple of hours on the phone, it's come out that you did actually all along underneath want to get together. <laughs> if you want to come and see me, she said, you should have the decency to say so in so many words. And by then, of course, like any polite man who wants to spend time with a woman he respects, instead of making your invitation some sort of icky accusation, by then, of course, I said, it's gotten to be pretty late in the day, which means that by the time we actually do get together, which is what you've secretly wanted all along, it's very late. And when we then inevitably go ahead and sleep together, instead of insidiously twi twisting things around, she said, so that it looks like my neediness rather than yours, my lousy life rather than your own lousy life, inevitably go ahead and sleep together. I don't want to sleep with you. I don't want to see you. That's not why I called. I called to say a simple thing, which it's three or four in the morning before we actually get around to the sleeping part of sleeping together, which with three hours of travel and a work day ahead of me has tended in the past to become kind of a bad scene. <laughs> is all I'm trying to remind you. If you want to come out and go for a hike with me, she said, that would be very nice. I would like that. But you have to say it's what you want. But I didn't call you, I said. But you were the one who brought up getting together. So just be honest with me now. Is it something you want? Not unless you want it and say so like a human being. But that perfectly mirrors my own sentiments. So, look, I called, she said. You could at least, what could I do? Do you think I'm going to harm you if you let your defenses down for one tiny half second? I mean, what do you think I'm going to do? Make you my slave? Force you to be married to me again? It's a hike, for God's sake. It's just a hike. Simply to avoid the two-hour version of this conversation wherein... <laughs> Party A tried to prove that Party B had made the fatal statement that prolonged the conversation in the first place. And Party B challenged Party A's version of events, and this in turn, there being no actual transcript, compelled Party A to reconstruct from memory the conversation's overture, and Party B to offer a reconstruction that differed from Party A's in certain <laughs> crucial respects, which then necessitated a time-devouring joint effort to collate and reconcile the two reconstructions. I agreed to go out to New Jersey and take a hike. That was great. Um, and I was just talking to someone just before who was saying to make sure that I stress that I don't have to do it now, how funny John's work is. Um, but sometimes people forget that because it's so, the work is so powerful. Um, um, but I thought I'd start by saying a couple things about this terrific book. And one, I, I mean, I'm so honored to be here on the publication day, first of all, with you. Um, and um, I've decided this is sort of your coming out as a California writer. Um, it's sort of, I mean, I always thought of you as a New York writer because when I met you, you were living in New York and seemed quintessentially New York, but you have become Californian over time and it's appropriate that you're here and it's appropriate that so much of your book takes place in California. And the second part of the question is, the other thing people know you as is- Whoa, 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 okay. first part of the question. <laughs> It's not a question, it's a statement. Okay. But, but is it fair to call you a California writer at this point? Let, let's do that and I'll get to the second half of my question. I have a California driver's license. <laughs> I am a writer. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Sure. Great, all right, I'm glad we established that. That was silly of me to interrupt. Go on. Yes. 
<laughs> but the other the other part of it is is it's thinking of you as as, as a great American novelist, and this book. Um, you, you, you become a sort of, you take on the whole world. I mean, because it, the, the novel also takes place in Berlin and Bolivia and, it, and its scope is larger. And um, I'm wondering if that was a conscious decision, you know, on, on your part um, to sort of tackle a, a larger geography with this. Um. Well, well, it was conscious to the extent that I was conscious while I was writing. But, um, <laughs> Uh, no, no, I was not trying to become uh, um, a world novelist. I, I think that, I mean, if someone says world novelist, I run screaming from the room. Um, <laughs> world novelist. Um, <laughs> when someone pushes a book toward me and says world novelist, I say, eh, and push it back. Um, no, I, I don't want to be a world novelist. Uh, it, it happened that I thought I spent a lot of time in Germany through a weird series of accidents um, and had always had it in mind to do something with Germany. And I don't know, I feel like I'm perennially short on material uh, and it happened that I'd been in Bolivia a couple of times and um, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, almost every place I've ever been, I will use because I don't go. Yeah, but, but life is longer than one might think, uh, and art is shorter than one might think. <laughs> so it was just what I had in hand when the when the when the book was coming together. Um, but, 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 but yeah, but the place, but Bolivia really this Bolivia is a really really striking place and. If you're doing a book that has a pastoral dimension, um, that is pastoral in the kind of literary critical sense, the uh, Northrop Fry sense, where you need a place that you get away to, you know, out of the city, out of the corrupt city, um, it suggested itself. Well, one thing in that each section is so distinctly a part of the, the particular consciousness of the central character in that section. There's a variety of different sections. And in the previous section, we've been in sort of the dark, we'll get to this, but the dark sort of internal machinations of Andreas. And then we get to sort of Pip's mind when we move to Bolivia and we begin with that strong sense of smell and that sort of sensory. It's such a relief to be out of Andreas's brain and then, you know, and to be with Pip experiencing the sort of the beauty, the smells, this sort of the, this 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 ex, this place that she's excited to be at, and and leaves her open to Andreas, I guess. So, but um, now is there a question there? Um, <laughs> one of the one of the, the the questions that I want to ask is is it almost felt as I was reading like like several distinctive books. You know, I mean they hold together beautifully as a novel, but. Um, I can't imagine you writing two sections at once. It seemed that each one seemed so entirely its own thing, and I'm wondering, if, and more so than than in your other books, I would say, um, in terms of the Andrea style is so, it, as I said, it's so. It, it almost reminded me of, of Dreiser, of like American Tragedy or Patricia Highsmith, very you know internal, and then the sort of the section that you just read and, to, and that with Tom and Annabelle that felt more reminiscent of the corrections or the early parts of freedom. But it just felt like so so very different each section. And I'm wondering about the process of I'm just rambling here. Right? <laughs> of, of, of writing that you know, if, if if they were written in discrete time periods each one and then you move to the next where where everything completely changed, the voice changed, the sensibility, etc. Yes. <laughs> What else you got there? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I got lots of stuff here, so. Um, well, let me ask you about murder. It's the first time you've, like, you know, what was it like writing? I mean, I'm not revealing too much. I think we, it's, it's sort of in all the descriptions of the book, but but it's it, it seems like new territory for you to write. Um, can I ask about <laughs> I feel like you're going to say yes to me. <laughs> but writing from the sensibility of someone so dark, you know, and capturing the, the and, and capturing it in a way that feels, if not sympathetic, understandable. The challenges of that. Um, 
Um, yeah. Uh, it's it's no secret. There's a murder in the book. It was in the New Yorker, um, and it comes fairly early. And and actually, the whole book is I hope set up so that it doesn't depend on withheld information. You can know what all the secrets are, and it, it still I think holds up. I hope. Um, although I'm not going to tell you other secrets, but I will. <laughs> one by one. If we talk long enough, you will. <laughs> uh, the murder. So, yeah, I, had, I, I liked Andreas, but I was worried that other people wouldn't. Um, Andreas gets his hands dirty uh, in Berlin. And, um, I knew he needed a secret like that, and really, what better secret is there than, I killed a man. Um, that's like the granddaddy of all secrets. Um, so it had to be, and then how do, you make, how do you make that person sympathetic? So, so all the stuff with Annegret, uh, this young, she's just a girl really, this girl who he's trying to protect with that murder. Um, that was added kind of desperately with a lot of earth moving equipment um, to shore up basic sympathy for our killer. Um, I mean, you, you sit on stage or I sit on stage in a kind of whoopee cushion. <laughs> <laughs> I should almost put the mic on it. Um, <laughs> one sits on stage, and uh, and after spending a couple of years making a book, and there are all these things you're doing out of rather crass considerations of how it might be experienced by a reader and the safest thing I guess is to pretend that you're just doing exactly the story the way you want to do it and you don't ever think about what the reader might care about or how the reader might respond um, and to do anything else would be just crass commercialism um, and there is an element of truth to that uh, the fact that I do think about well not everyone's going to like this guy. How do I make him at least somewhat more sympathetic? Um, but I, I, it should be admitted that I, I do that, but it's weird to talk about that because it's, especially if you haven't read the book yet, um, there is the thing and then there's the process of the thing. And the, and the process of the thing is kind of weird to talk about on publication day. But well, one of the things I was going to say about... Like, I'm rambling. Yeah. Come in with one of your... Loquacious question. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be. Lo you know, let's see. I might still be loquacious. Um, one of the things about Andreas is it's less that we. It, I find him somewhat likable, but it's more that the people that we find likable are susceptible to him in ways that we can. So the ones that we identify, whether it's Tom or Pip, we can see them wanting desperate wanting his attention so much that they're jealous of somebody else of, of him having attention for anybody else. And I think in those moments. What we feel is less that we like him, and more that if we ran into him, we would fall under his spell, I would say. Good. Um, I, yeah, I, maybe a word about this whole likability issue. Um, I, I'm, I'm so annoyed by the word likable. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> I'm participating in the Wall Street Journal Book Club this month, maybe next month. Uh, and I picked one of the great short novels of the 20th century, Kansabara Oe's A Personal Matter, which I recommend to all of you if you have not read it. Because you recommended it to me when I met you and I read it. So. Right. <laughs> and was it good? It was really good. It's really good. <laughs> um, it's a knockout book. And I had to do this hour-long interview with the extremely nice, likable, <laughs> Wall Street Journal writer, and she said, but this character isn't likable. I said, what's not likable about him? He's 
wife has given birth to a baby who's described as a monster that is so extremely deformed that the delivering obstetrician can't stop giggling as he describes him to the father and that he then thinks about possibly letting the child die that's like that's what she was she said well god he was thinking about killing his own child and that's a dislikable character why did you inflict this book on us i don't like him and you know he maybe he's not so likable he drinks an entire bottle of scotch and gets sick on his girlfriend's floor uh <clears throat> but it's not the issue whether he's likable or not. The issue is that you can, what would you do in that situation? Um, so sympathy, I think, is, is very, very different from likability. And, and it just, it infuriates me when, when good books are judged by that really lame commercial standard. Do I like this person? You know, would I want to have a beer with this person? <laughs> You know, I, would I want to have a beer with Raskolnikov? I don't think so. <laughs> he, I mean, you could just see how fidgety he is. He probably smells bad. I do not like Raskolnikov, and yet he's one of the great sympathetic characters in world literature. I still would want to have a beer with Andreas, but not an extended one. You always were sort of, kind of... You were on, you know, on the bisexuality spectrum. There was... <laughs> No, and I, I say that in, we're in Marin County, I could say that. Okay. Um, you want to have a beer with Andreas? Yes. Even yes. though he, he kills people. Yeah, well, yeah. maybe not an extended beer. Um, chronology, I wanted to talk about in the book, um, Switching Gears, um, from my own bisexuality. <laughs> but, oh, I um, love it, Todd. It's yeah. part of why I like you so much. <laughs> Um, but there's almost that, it, I mean, it's, it, it, I was thinking almost of Pulp Fiction, of the sense of being in the middle of a situation, and then I found myself disoriented and then pleased as I circled around back and understood where I was. Um, but we, we, when you talked about the fact of the secrets, part of it is a lot of the stuff we learn and then we go back in time so much. So I was wondering about the pleasures, you know, of, of, of doing that. and whether you knew all, like whether it, 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 there was some reshuffling of the deck afterwards when you figured out which section would go where or you know how that how it occurred to you to to order the book the way you did so yeah it is sort of a book about secrets um although it's also about idealism and guilt uh and fame and charisma and Power and Journal facts. journalism. So I knew there were secrets. That was kind of that was in the DNA from the start, from the proposal I wrote three years ago. Um, and the secrets are very. The last thing you want is to have the suspense generated by your turn you don't you don't want to be turning the pages as a reader just to find out what the information is um because or at least i don't want that's not my idea of of first of all there's kind of bad faith there if i know what the secret is why shouldn't i tell the reader kind of right up front um, so, from the very beginning, I was trying to figure out ways to get the important secrets out fairly early. Um, so that it, there, was, there would be, for one thing, so it would be spoiler-proof, um, but also uh, to try to say, hey, we're all in this together, I'm not going to hold back more than I have to. You're going to, as soon as it can reasonably be done, I'm going to tell you what the secrets are. Um, so that you slow down and you're not just like skipping ahead to see what the answer to that question is. Um, so that, yeah, the, 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 the structure was pretty clear. What the characters did for a living and where they lived was a much harder thing to figure out. Um, 
You know, I, I put down some of the, the things, I mean, the, the, the sort of big ideas that the book wrestles with, and, um, but one of them is, is, and I was wondering if you'd talk about it yourself, is the, the concept of fame and how it changes the people around you. you, you there's a discussion of how lonely fame is in the book, and you, your, your sort of trajectory of being someone who put out very well-received novels, but when I met you, wasn't you weren't you could walk anywhere, you could walk into Book Passage and not be recognized, and now you have this room, you know, life has changed for you, I wonder if you drew on that in any way to, to write about it, you know, or you know, some of your thoughts as you wrote about, about fame, you know, in the book and just in general, you know, I, I guess some of your thoughts about it in, in your own life. Well, this isn't a random coalescence of people who would recognize me. This was an advertised event. Um, <laughs> but how many of you would, way, would, would recognize him? Which on, is by, the by way of saying, um, most days of the week, I can walk. The writer, you know, famous writer, oxymoron. Uh, <laughs> that's Gorbadal's joke, not mine. But. Uh, <clears throat> Seriously, it's not, what do I know about fame? Not much. Um, but enough to, enough to extrapolate. What well, do I know about killing people? I, <laughs> not much. Well, put it this, so, but, but having, having, you know, you've been scrutinized in the media and you've had certain things, you've had that experience, certainly, and which, which your character is undressed, certainly does. So. I, yes, I'm, I'm told I'm singularly bad at publicity and image management. <laughs> I believe that charge was leveled in a cover story for Time Magazine. <laughs> How bad could I be? Um, but apparently, yes, I... Uh, <laughs> um, so I know, yeah, no, I know about saying the wrong thing or... Or saying the right thing but being misquoted, I do know that. Or writing something and being mischaracterized and misquoted. Um, and and I also know that that anxiety of Andreas is about you know, this, this persona that you really have no control over that is being shaped on the internet. Um, I know a little of that. Uh, but it's important to stress that I don't do what Andreas does, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Um, um, speaking of the internet, there was a, a quote I wanted to read from the book. <coughs> Let us bow our heads. Yeah. <laughs> Page 492. <laughs> the aim of the internet and its associated technologies was to, quote, liberate humanity from the tasks, making things, learning things, remembering things, that had previously given meaning to life and thus had constituted life. Now it seemed as if the only task that meant anything was search engine optimization. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, about that? Well, that's from Andreas's point of view, of course. Um, and he is an internet guy. He is a creature of the internet. Uh, just to fill, fill you in, he was a... Um, he was not a dissident, but everyone thought he was a dissident in the federal, uh, in the um, German De Democratic Republic, and uh, <clears throat> and then he became a famous internet guy. So he's he uh, and and he's having those thoughts um, at a point when there's a little secret, not a big secret, just even a little secret. He was photographed with the wrong person. Um, that he's just terribly, terribly worried is going to come to light. Uh, and that is, that is the thought process of someone who has decided to spend hours every day desperately trying to control his internet persona. Um, it's not me. <laughs> Clearly. Um, no, but, but I also know that like you either either play the game or you don't, and you don't play it at your own, at your own uh, risk. Um, spoiler alert: there is a lot of sex in this book, um, and I remember the criteria. We talk about because I teach creative writing, and my, some of my students are here. And you know, one of the criteria of it is that it shows right, it contains tension and shows character. Um, the sex scenes are, are great, but they're, 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 they're 
I mean, they're such an, um, it, it's impossible to imagine this book without them in terms of how important they are, how much the, the sort of seduction, the use of power, um, how much is involved, uh, you know, how much of the book is told through these, these scenes. So I wonder if you could talk about that. I mean, a lot of writers, because there are writers in the room, uh, most, most, most of the, you know, my students just don't do it. They're just sort of afraid to tackle it. And in fact, your name has come up in writing workshops as someone who writes really well about it. So. My question is the challenges <laughs> of writing about it. Do you want to, you know, address it, you know, at all, or in its role in the book? Um, I have to think about it. Well, I mean, even just beginning with, with, with Pitt, you know, and, and, and Andreas, I guess. Or you can begin anyway. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard to get the bike to pick it up. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm about to stand up and take some audience questions. But, um, we, we could do that. Uh, There's a lot of sex in there. <laughs> Thank you, noted. Um, I, I can say that it got easier to do that after my parents had died. Um, <laughs> Although there was sex in the first two books, and they were alive, and um, and I think were they were disturbed by it uh, because it, they'd grown up in well, for all intents and purposes, the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, I think everything I write is almost everything. I, 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 it's almost impossible for me to let stand a sentence that doesn't have some element of humor in it. Um, I know it's not often apparent. Uh, it becomes more apparent if I'm allowed to read something aloud. But that's just the way it, I see the world. Um, I, I try to put an ironic or a comic spin on almost everything out of my mouth. Uh, and also every, everything I write. Um, and I think that stands you in good stead. Often what's off-putting about a sex scene when it's badly done in a book is the feeling that the author has gotten really into it <laughs> and has, has forgotten, you know, it, it is like so into it that they're, they've kind of lost their writer conscience and are just hoping they're having such a good time, the reader will have a good time too. Um, right? I would say that's true and for so, movies too. Yeah. And so, you know, just little word choices and little ironic, bit of ironic English on a sentence, those are little pings you're giving out, just like wail to wail, uh, writer to reader. Trust me, all of the critical faculties are still functioning. <laughs> But I, the author is not totally into it. The author is speaking of you, reader. That's kind of, I mean, to, yeah. But, but maybe I'm saying more about the weird mental process of being a writer than I should, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. Well, I think it does something different, which is that it seems to me that, that, that in a lot of the things, the characters, we have, we have access to their consciousness. They're all pretty intelligent people, but often they do things that are contrary to whatever they've rationalized in their mind, and that's where the sex comes in a way. It's, it's sort of it's something that they can't rationalize or figure out intellectually, and they're 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 drawn. That's what they're often making a mistake, and what's more funny than a mistake? <laughs> Correct. Maybe we should go to the. Oh, I'm going to stand up, although not without one last try at getting this to the people in back. No. <laughs> All right, the fun has been had. <laughs> Here I am congratulating myself on, on not being one of those writers who do things, gets really into them without caring whether other people are into them. And I go and do a thing like that. Yes, sir, in the corner. 
the Japanese uh, American critic for the New York Times, I forget her name. Michiko Kakutani. <laughs> Who's uh, in the novel? Uh, <laughs> and, and you, uh, uh, broadly uh, up Daikin, uh, would you care to comment about either of those people, John Updike or the critic? Can you read the question? Oh, yes. Um, would I care to comment about either? Uh, this is like <laughs> Scylla and Charybdis. Um, <laughs> Michiko Kakutani or John Updike. Um, one is dead and the other... <laughs> what? Though seldom seen, <laughs> is by all appearances alive and well. Um, you know, she and I have a weird little little love-hate thing going. I, um, I did, I was quoted uh, in a public place calling her the stupidest person in New York City. <clears throat> Very smart. Um, and because she gave, I mean, I, I don't read the reviews, I never read reviews, um, but uh, by all accounts, she gave a, just a mammothly stupid review of my memoir, uh, The Discomfort Zone. Humorless review of a book that, if you're not getting the humor, you're in trouble. Um, and it's, but it's not that hard to get. Uh, and so, so she and I go way back. <laughs> but honestly, she's reviewed five of five of my four of my novels, and she's been nice to all of them. So, there. <laughs> Maybe we'll take another question from over on the other side, gentleman in the pale blue shirt. Could, could you talk about your process of creating characters? <clears throat> Show of hands. Interest in, in hearing the process of creating characters? Okay, good. That's good. That's good. Um, uh, well, since it's the bulk of what I do, it's the hardest thing. It's the most important thing. It's the thing that takes almost all of my real work. Um, the writing is almost trivial. Uh, creating characters is not trivial. Um, I could say a lot. <clears throat> and when I cast around for short, helpful answers, I find things I've said before, and then I come up against my horror of repeating myself. But maybe I'll repeat myself a little bit. Um, I have to, uh, I'm looking to, to love the character. I'm looking to fall in love with something about them, basically. If I'm not loving the character, then, then it's not working, and it shows up immediately on the page. Um, and once I really love the character, the whole character of the pages changes because I've got something, because I know them. And you don't love someone you don't know. You know you love one, somebody you know, and so, but you don't know all of them at first. And so in the same way that once you meet, you, you might be interested in someone, and then you meet them, and you find yourself loving them, and then you find out a lot of things about them. But it's all following the track laid down by that love. Um, I don't know where I'm going exactly with this metaphor, but uh, that's how it... <clears throat> It's mysterious in that way. And, 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 and to find someone I love, I have to be able to picture them. And it can't be someone I know very well, because why would I take somebody I know well and love and turn them into a character? Um, so people who I've loved but didn't know very well, maybe even met once and spent an evening with, those are great. <laughs> Um, those are wonderful because then I can picture that person and I know almost nothing about them, which means I can make it all up. And yet that warm feeling I had remains. Um, so that's just a totally random scattershot few answers to your question for which I thank you. Yes, um, in the middle. I read somewhere that you uh, were in Stinson Beach with David Foster Wallace and you were <coughs> doing 
what? We were driving along in a car. <laughs> We did pass some long-billed curlews, and I stopped the car because long-billed curlews are pretty great. <laughs> and I wanted Dave to take a look at them through my scope, and he did. Then we got, we were, yeah, he and I never went bird watching. He was not a birder. But we were in Stenson Beach. His whole family was there, actually. Yes? I want to thank you for the character of Patty and Freedom. And I want to ask you, what, um, what interviews do you enjoy? And would you consider going on with um, Jess Walter and Sherman Alexi and Tiny Sense of Accomplishment, where they have authors interviewed to talk about their writing process? Would you consider something like that? <coughs> If, if somebody asked me to, like somebody who I'm in fear of or I'm trying to make happy, like, which is to say if a publisher asked me to do this, I would. Um, I find process really hard to talk about, as I just demonstrated. Um, maybe. That sounds interesting, huh? <laughs> yes, oh, we here. I'm going to go first to you. And Where does the title come from? The title is actually the name of a character in the book. Um, one of four or five main characters has that name, um, and she hates it. <laughs> She's a she's a young woman from the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you know uh, it's a good idea for the writer to get deep into the sexual stuff in, in, this, in the book that there might be writing. But, uh, I mean, into it in the sense of like just lost in it and kind of whether because they're really freaked out and the only way they can write it is to kind of put their blinkers on and get through the scene or because they're like yeah <laughs> so into it I didn't I think it's fine to get into sex as a subject matter okay. well what I was wondering was when you're writing humor are you laughing when you're writing because I noticed that I, I write and I crack myself up all the time it's like it doesn't come out that funny <laughs> I crack myself up just sometimes. I shouldn't admit it, but I do. Um, and every once in a while, I, I make myself cry, too. Um, it happened last night in Santa Cruz. It was weird. There was a thing I hadn't even realized. I was a dupe of my own creation. I was just reading along. I gave a full reading last night in Santa Cruz and um, hit this line and I suddenly got choked up and I was like, do not show the audience that you're getting choked up in your own work. Uh, but I never realized that it was actually, it was kind of a choke up line potentially. So that, it, like I discovered that reading it. Yes, right behind. Um, you got a lot of your fame and notoriety from <clears throat> Corrections and Freedom. Um, no variety, like, <laughs> like Jesse James. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, critics would probably call those like your serious or amb like, most ambitious books. But I actually enjoy your first two books more. I'm wondering, like, how do you, how do those two books sit in your mind? Are you, are you proud of them? Are they like, where do they sit in how you feel about your work? You might like the new book a lot because I went back to the first two books and tried to rewrite them as a guy in his 50s, because um, those are written by a guy in his 20s. Uh, the first one I mutilated a little bit. Um, it was much longer, and I was desperate to get it published commercially, and so I just kept chopping it down and chopping it down, and I think I, I actually probably took about 70 pages too much, um, but it's an impressive work for a 25-year-old. Um, 
I would have sent, just kind of sight unseen, I would have sent that 25 year old into 10 years of therapy. Um, the inexplicable levels of rage in that book uh, were alarming. <laughs> um, and the second novel, uh, you know, I live with someone whose favorite book of mine that is. So it got me a great woman. Um, <laughs> so I could never disavow that book, even if I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> um, that everyone's falling in good. Are we actually? I'll take maybe one or one if one if it's long, two if it's quick. Yes, sir. Well, I, I just want to ask a question about emptying the skies, which is just a wonderful documentary, which I should say now is available through Amazon. I have not been able to find it, but I just wanted to ask you uh, in connection with that documentary, can you give any sort of just brief? follow-up as to what's been happening with the, the slaughter of birds uh, in Cyprus and those places that were documented there? The question is about emptying the skies, a documentary about um, the killing of migratory birds in the Mediterranean. Um, <clears throat> which That movie itself was based on a long piece of mine in The New Yorker. I also did another long piece for National Geographic on a different part of the Mediterranean. Um, Interesting that you should ask what's up with it. Uh, the BirdLife International, which is a slow and cautious but well-meaning um, worldwide conservation group, just is now issuing its report. And although they have a very low number, 25 million birds a year killed illegally um, in the Mediterranean, I'm actually kind of one of the world's leading experts on the subject. Um, and I've probably spent six months of my life one way or another researching and reporting that subject. Um, I think that's a very low figure, but apparently they're taking it to um, Brussels and people there are outraged because it comes with bird life's imprimatur and 25 million, I think it's, that's a super low figure. Um, it could easily be a couple hundred million a year uh, based on what I've seen and um, extrapolated from, especially in Egypt. But, uh, so it's getting some attention. And what's happening, I mean, a lot of it is illegal, uh, it's, il it's illegal killing on a mass scale in member countries, member nations of the European Union. So I think there, there's some possibility for change. And after the National Geographic piece came out, uh, Albania instituted a two year total ban on hunting that after having essentially removed every bird from Albania, um, it was time to catch a breath. So some good things are happening. It's a push and a pull. Um, people don't like to admit that things aren't sustainable. Things that were sustainable for millennia no longer are. And this is a, this is a great example of it. Uh, and it's particularly, it's, it's a, it's a tough problem, and particularly uh, on the um, African side of the ocean, or the sea. And, and just a follow-up, just the people that you portrayed, I think the CAPS people, Yeah. I'm just curious, are they still going at it? Yeah, they're in Cyprus right now. The, um, the people in the movie are there um, risking life and limb uh, combating the poachers. Yes, they are. And actually, that was a long question on the subject of birds, so maybe I'll just, oh, is this a quick one? Yes. Perhaps it's not good enough. <laughs> Anything yes. Okay. I, I wrote the memoir after I'd gotten beat up um, in the press because of my run-in with Oprah Winfrey. Um, and, uh, and there was all this speculation about what kind of person I was, but it, was, it didn't, wasn't couched as speculation, it was couched as, couched as assertion that I was a terrible person. Um, and so I wanted to actually do a really good job of explaining to people what a terrible person I am. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but what's notable is, you know, that book is my shortest book. 
and it's pretty much all the good stories I had about myself. So the um, it's a, it's a measure of how much exaggeration is needed to write novels, um, and how much you need to make stuff up. But that's that's how it fits in. Thank you very much for sitting here. Thank you.